Welcome and thanks for joining us for another NWBA online reflection which we offer as one way of trying to support you through these difficult and challenging times and I suspect that I'm not the only person who has found myself in the last few months asking deep and serious questions about what really matters in my faith and for me of course it's not just my faith it's about the job that I do the role that I believe that I have been called to fulfill and how I should respond when and that role has, at least in terms of the physical things that I do, changed so dramatically. And that in turn has caused me to notice and to pay attention to things in our scriptures that I can't say I wasn't aware of before, but perhaps just didn't notice the significance of them. And one of those things is just how disconnected the early church was. Now, I guess I need to explain what I mean by that, because I suspect that many people would immediately want to come straight back at me and say, hang on a minute, what about all those narratives about them being united in Christ, one in the spirit, a body, and, and so I could go on. But I think that's my point. We read our scriptures and we recognise that that is true. They were, at one level, an incredibly united group of people. So much so that when there's concern at the church in Antioch about whether or not they're getting it right in terms of the inauguration rites of the Jewish faith, they're prepared to send a delegation to Jerusalem and to eventually bring the whole church together to discern a good and appropriate way forward. So yeah, they were incredibly connected in terms of their desire to act and to work as one but they were incredibly disconnected in terms of the physical space and interaction and what we've got to remember of course is that the early church didn't have the kind of technologies that we've come to take for granted the kind of technology that enables me to sit in my house and to speak into a computer and for you to then engage with what I have to say that kind of thing would have been unthinkable for the early believers just imagine what was involved in traveling on foot no doubt from Antioch to Jerusalem just to work out one issue that we'd probably deal with in a phone call today how do we remain together and one when we are so diverse and separated that was a constant challenge for the early church and one that perhaps we might more easily come to recognize and appreciate through the things that we are facing at the moment and a lot of what we call now the new testament emerged out of that reality the Gospels, the stories of the life and teaching of Jesus were put together because the generation of apostles who could share their experience through first hand testimony and stories were beginning to die out and increasingly displaced from this ever growing Christian community. It needed to be written down so it could be preserved and disseminated more easily. The New Testament epistles are the letters that flew to and fro between the early church communities and the leaders and church planters that they looked to to guide them. And the Acts of the Apostles is the narrative that joins it all together as we learn about how those leaders and those local church communities came to be what they were. Now, that isn't to say that there's not a load more to the New Testament than that. But whereas the Old Testament is very much the story of a single nation, a fixed entity that recognised itself as the people of God, the New Testament is much more an account of a scattered community, not bound by any single location or national or cultural identity, but a people who were to be found all over the place, often isolated from one another, speaking different languages, operating in very different cultural settings. And we might say, therefore, that the narratives of the New Testament are the glue that held them together. And if you're part of that narrative, if you're faced with the challenge of trying to hold that community together, what are you going to say? What are going to be your priorities? Well, to some degree, that's a question that we don't need to answer for ourselves because the New Testament answers it for us. But it does seem to me that, 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 that therefore we would do well to pay careful attention to what those New Testament writers have to say. Because they, of all people, should know what it is that this disconnected, diverse, scattered community needed to have in common and what we need to have in common, therefore. And that's what I find interesting. Now, I know that many of us are dismayed at the fact that so many of our regular church activities have been taken from us, at least for a season. 
And many of the networks and friendship circles that we've associated with that have become severely disrupted. But this is where I have to be honest and say that when I look at the sort of things that we are lamenting the loss of, it's not those things themselves that feature so highly in the New Testament uh, narratives, but what those things were seeking to achieve. And I don't say that to be dismissive, and I certainly don't want to say that some of the things that you're missing are not important, or even that you're wrong for missing them. But I do want to offer us some encouragement that our faith and our identity in Jesus does not depend on those things. And I want to spend a few moments in this reflection putting a spotlight on another of those New Testament letters and then invite you to ponder some of the issues that emerge from it. Now this one is a letter to the church in Colossae, the book of Colossians, a town in the western part of Turkey that was written by the Apostle Paul. And it's interesting because whereas most of the letters that Paul writes are to churches that he's founded, the church in Colossae has actually been started by a guy called Epaphras, from what we can gather, a local. Paul describes him as one of you and someone that we think was associated with and influenced by the church at Ephesus, in which Paul had played a very active role. So it's a local church founded by local people and no doubt shaped by its own unique circumstances and situation. And we might see Paul's letter to them, therefore, not only as a massive affirmation of all of that work, but an outline of what it was they belonged to, what they had in common with all those other Christian communities from which they were separated by culture and geography, but nonetheless a valued and authentic part of. And Paul gives thanks for them. He affirms them and he informs them that he and the Christian community of which he's a part are praying for them. And what interests me is how he's been praying for them, because that in turn reveals something of what defines them as part of that broader Christian community. So let's take a look at what Paul says. And I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 14. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened, with with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light for he has rescued us from the domination of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. We have not stopped praying for you. That in itself reflects something of the bond that existed between this church and its sister congregations. And that alone might encourage us to invest our time in praying for one another. But I want us to notice too what Paul prays for them. And in short, he prays that they might have wisdom. He prays that they might have strength. And he gives God thanks that they share in what he describes as the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. And I want to spend a little time simply reflecting a bit more on what these three elements have to say to us, because I sense that within them are some of the resources that we might find it helpful to draw on as we navigate our way through what are admittedly challenging and difficult times. And I want us to notice too, the source of these resources. He prays that they might have wisdom that is the gift of the Spirit. He prays they may have strength according to God's glorious might and an inheritance that God has qualified them to share in. God is the source of what they need. Now please don't mishear me. I, am no, I know that many of us are struggling by not having access to the life and activity of our local church fellowships. And I'm not saying for a moment that that isn't important. 
But time and time again, as we scour the New Testament for the values and priorities that shape and define the early believers, they are the things that are to be found in God, not in any form of religious activity or routine. Those things may help express it. Those things may help to find it. But it is God who is their source. And I hope that you can therefore draw a message of encouragement that these resources remain available to us because God is still with us, even though so much else might have changed around us. So let's pause and look at each of them. Paul first prays that they might have wisdom. Wisdom to understand God's will. Wisdom so that they may live a life worthy of the Lord and wisdom so that they might grow in their knowledge of God. Now I sense that many of us will be struggling to understand what's going on around us at the moment. And as a people of faith, they, that may well be a twofold struggle because we will have questions about how our earthly leaders and politicians are handling all of this, but we'll also have theological questions. What is God doing? What is God saying? Now, I can't answer all of those questions, but as I look again at the narratives of our scriptures, I begin to recognise that we are not the first Christian believers to find ourselves asking questions like that. Paul prays that they might have wisdom. And if everything was obvious and simple and straightforward, then this is not a prayer he would have needed to pray. And remember again that Paul took his prayers for the church in Colossae very seriously. We have not stopped praying for you, he says in verse 9. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge, he goes on to say. And it's difficult to navigate our way through challenging times when we don't understand the whys and the whats of, of what's going on around us. But he prays for God's wisdom. Wisdom that is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Not just a rush to embrace our own narratives and ideas, not just to work things out for ourselves, but to seek what God has to teach us. And then he prays for strength. And why does he see those early believers as needing strength? So they can rise like superheroes and just defeat and brush aside every challenge that comes their way? No. He says it here, so that you may have great endurance and patience. And again, I want us to pause and notice the reality of experience into which Paul was speaking. If everything's going fine, if there are no challenges and struggles, then you don't need endurance and patience. And particularly in our present circumstances, I think it's important for us to recognise that God is presented time and time again in the Old and the New Testaments, not simply as one who somehow waves away every trouble and challenge, but gives us the resources to get through them. We need to pray for one another and we need to pray for ourselves to receive the strength from God that we need. And then Paul reminds them of another gift that they have received from God. Wisdom and strength for the here and now, but also an inheritance, an assurance that though they may be very different to other Christian communities, though they may never have met most of the leaders and members of their sister congregations, they have a common inheritance, the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. The kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have forgiveness and redemption, says Paul. These are powerful words, and words that it will do us no harm to simply stop and savour. So spend a bit of time with them and let them speak to you. And so I simply want to invite you as ever to just spend some time with these words from the Bible. Find the space that you need to read and reflect on them. And if you can, try to share that with someone else, either by using some of this wonderful technology to actually physically connect with one another while you're reading this, or maybe perhaps ring each other up afterwards and share what you've gleaned from it. And allow the prayer of Paul for the church in Colossae to direct your prayers for yourself, for fellow Christians that you know, and the wider community of believers around the church, around the world, sorry. Let's pray for God's wisdom. Pray that we will be a people who don't just rush to the most obvious conclusion or get carried along by popular opinion, but seek the wisdom of God, 
the understanding that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom to know how to live in these difficult and unusual times in a way that, as Paul says, gives glory to God. Wisdom that will help us to grow in our own knowledge of God. So yes, even though our circumstances might be very different and the familiar routines of our discipleship journey may have been taken from us, we might nonetheless emerge from these challenging times as those who have grown in our knowledge of God. And I would invite you to pray for God's strength. And perhaps that might require of us to adjust the narratives of our prayers. It's easy to sometimes simply pray that all the things that require patience and endurance will be taken away. And God does invite us to place our petitions and our concerns before him. But we're also invited to pray for strength so that we might actually grow in our spiritual stature as a follower of Jesus as we work things through so that we might be an encouragement to our fellow strugglers. And it does strike me that what our church needs, what our world needs right now is not a church that somehow manages to avoid all of our present struggles, but one that can stand with people and help find a way through them and to do that in God's strength and not our own. And finally, let's give God thanks for the inheritance that is ours. You know, one of the people who has really inspired me in recent days is Mabel, a member of our NWBA community and a staff nurse at Withinshaw Hospital. And she made a short video for us for one of our online services. And she's right there in the middle of all this pandemic and all the strain that it's placing on people like her who work in our health service. And as she shared her story, she simply observed, these times will pass. And for us as a people of God, that is a message that resounds beyond this immediate crisis to every challenge and struggle that we face as a human race. These times will pass, but we have an inheritance. We have an investment in a world that transcends our human circumstances. And that doesn't make us indifferent to what people are facing in the here and now, but it equips us to be a people of hope in its midst and a people of grace because we are forgiven and a people of hope because we are redeemed. And though we have to live out our faith in the real world, we do so as citizens of God's new kingdom. So as we pray for ourselves and as we pray for each other, it seems to me that what Paul reminds us of here is that God has resources to offer us, to see us through these challenging times wisdom, strength, and an inheritance that is secure. Thanks for listening.